the non-existence of magic by roger bacon 1214 to 1294 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org roger bacon the greatest natural philosopher of the middle ages was born in somersetshire england about twelve hundred and fourteen educated at oxford and paris by a luckless impulse he joined the franciscan mendicant order for which he had no vocation and which conflicted violently with his real one his mind was singularly like that of his great namesake francis bacon he believed in observation and experiment as the basis of deduction and never ceased urging the study of original sources and texts as the basis of any sound theological knowledge this theory counsel and practice convinced his superiors that he was heretically minded and dangerous and they imprisoned him for some years about twelve sixty five pope clement the fourth hearing of his scientific attainments asked him to write out and send a summary of what he knew in an incredibly short time though denied pens and paper except by special permission penniless and obliged to get materials and skilled help he wrote and sent his vast opus magus a summary of all known science and filled with original experiments and acute deductions he wrote also the opus minus opus tertium and minor pieces in twelve seventy eight his writings were condemned by his order as heretical and he was again confined he died in twelve ninety four his medieval repute as a magician was an ironical fate for one whose chief work was to combat such delusions to william of paris of and against fabricated appearances and of and against invocation of spirits i respond heartily to your request for though nature may be potent and wonderful yet art using nature as an instrument is more potent than natural gifts as we see in many things but whatever is beyond the operation of nature or of art either is not human or is fabricated and filled with frauds for there are those who fabricating appearances by swift motion of the organs or diversity of voices or ingenuity of apparatus or darkness or by collusion put many marvels before mortals which have no truths of existence the world is full of these as is manifest to the inquirer the jugglers play many tricks by quickness of hand and mediums fabricating a variety of voices in the stomach and throat and mouth form human voices far and near as they choose as if a spirit spoke through the man and they shape sounds as of brutes but pipes laid under the grass and hidden in recesses of the ground show us that the voice is human not of spirits which is fabricated with such huge mendacity and when inanimate things are moved swiftly in the dusk of morning or evening that is not reality but fraud and trick as to collusion it fabricates everything men wish according as they arrange with each other into all these however neither philosophic consideration investigates nor art nor the power of nature pauses to look but beside these is a more mischievous occupation when men against the laws of philosophy and against all reason invoke nefarious spirits through whom to achieve their will and their mistake is in this that they believe spirits to be subject to them and coerced by human power for this is impossible because human force is far inferior to that of spirits and on this point men err still more in this that they believe by the use of some natural means they can summon spirits or put them to flight and the error has been made up to this time when men strive by invocations and supplications and sacrifices to placate them and bring them into the service of the summoners while it would be much easier without such trial of skill to supplicate god or the good spirits for whatever man ought to repute useful 
since not even in useless matters do malign spirits appear favourable except so far as sinful deeds are permitted through men by god who rules and guides the human race and so these methods are beyond the example set by wisdom on the contrary they rather operate the other way nor do the truly philosophic ever concern themselves in the manner following of magic characters charms and their uses what should be held concerning charms and characters and other things of the kind i consider after this fashion it is far from doubtful that everything of the kind is at the present time false and uncertain for whatever things are universally beyond reasoning out which philosophers have come upon in the works of nature or art they have hidden as secrets from the unworthy thus if it were universally unknown that a magnet draws iron and someone wished to perform this feat in public he would draw characters and utter charms lest it might be perceived that the whole work of attraction was natural all such performances must be erroneous thus therefore so many things are hidden in the worlds of philosophers in many ways that a wise man ought to have the prudence to neglect charms and characters and investigate the works of nature and art and thus he should perceive that things as well animate as inanimate harmonize with each other according to the conformities of nature not according to the virtue of characters or a charm and thus many secrets of nature and art are estimated as magic by the unlearned and the magicians foolishly confide in characters and charms to which they ascribe virtue and by following them forsake the works of nature or art for the error of charms and characters and so this race of men is deprived of the utilities of wisdom impelled by its folly there are certain supplications of antiquity instituted by righteous men or still higher ordained by god and the angels and these can thus retain their primal virtue so in many regions to this day certain utterances are made over burning iron and over the waters of a stream and other like matters by which the innocent are absolved or the guilty condemned in the case and these are made by the authority of the church and of prelates for even the priests themselves make exorcisms with blessed water as is written in the old law of purgation by water by which the woman is proved an adulteress or faithful to her husband and there are many of the sort but the things contained in the magician's books are all forbidden by law however much truth they may contain because they are so much abused by rogues that it is not possible to distinguish between the true and the false hence whatever they say as to solomon or other wise men having composed this or that is to be denied because books of this sort are not received by the authority of the church nor by the wise but by misleaders who deceive the world furthermore they compose new books themselves and multiply new inventions as we know by experience and then that they may entice men the more forcibly they prefix famous titles to these books and imprudently ascribe them to great authors and that they may leave no contingency unprovided for they devise a high-sounding style and fabricate lies under the pretense of their text as to characters they are either words arranged in inscribed figures containing the sense of a manufactured utterance or they are made to represent the appearance of the stars at chosen times of characters therefore our first judgment must be according to what is said of the utterances of the second sort if they are not made at the chosen times we know they have no inner efficacy and so he who makes them as they are formed in the books regarding nothing except the figure alone which he represents according to his pattern is judged by the wise as having done nothing they who know how to perform their work under the constellations due at a given phase of the sky are able to arrange not merely characters but all works either of art or nature according to the virtue of the sky 
but because it is difficult to know the skies with surety so there is much terror in them to many and there are few who know how to classify anything usefully and truthfully and therefore the mob of mathematicians judging and operating by the great stars do not accomplish much or do anything useful the learned however and those having sufficient skill can do many useful things as much by judgment as by working at chosen periods it is to be taken into consideration that a skilled physician and whoever else has to arouse the spirit can usefully according to the physician constantine employ charms and characters even if feigned not because the characters and charms themselves accomplish anything but that the medicine may be received more trustingly and eagerly and the spirit of the patient stimulated and he may more abundantly confide and hope and enjoy because the stimulated spirit can renovate many things in the body it informs so that it may convalesce from infirmity to health out of enjoyment and confidence if therefore the physician for the magnifying of his work that the patients may be excited to hope and confidence of health does something of this kind not for fraud nor for his own advantage if we believe the physician constantine it is not to be reprobated for he in his epistle concerning articles suspended from the neck thus allows charms and characters for the neck and defends them in such cases for the mind has much power over the body through its strong emotions as avicenna teaches in the fourth book on the mind and the eighth on animals and all wise men agree and thus sports are made in presence of the sick and agreeable things are brought to them on the other hand many things are sometimes conceded to the appetite because the passions conquer and the desire of life over death on wonderful artificial instruments i will first tell of the wonderful works of art in nature that i may afterwards assign the causes and manner of them in which there is nothing magical that it may be seen that all magic power is inferior to these works and worthless and first for the quality and reason of art alone for instruments of navigation can be made without men as rowers so that the largest ships river and ocean may be borne on with the guidance of one man with greater speed than if full of men also carriages can be made so that without an animal they may be moved with incalculable speed as we may assume the sith chariots to have been with which battles were fought in ancient times also instruments for flying can be made so that a man may sit in the middle of the instrument revolving some contrivance by which wings artificially constructed may beat the air in the manner of a flying bird also an instrument small in size for the elevation and depression of weights almost infinitely than which nothing more useful could chance for by an instrument three fingers high and the same breath and a less volume a man can snatch himself and his friends from all danger of prison both to elevate and descend an instrument can also be easily made by which one man can forcibly draw a thousand to him despite their will and so of drawing other things instruments can also be made for walking in the seas or rivers down to the bottom without bodily peril for alexander the great used these that he might view the secrets of the ocean according to what ethicus the astronomer narrates these things were done in ancient times and are done in our own as is certain unless it may be the instrument for flying which i have not seen nor do i know any man who has seen but i know that the wise man who planned this device completed it and such things can be made almost infinitely as bridges across rivers without pillars or any other support and machines and unheard-of devices of experiments in artificial sight but more philosophical forms have been invented 
for thus transparent glasses may be fashioned so that one may appear many and one man an army and as many suns and moons as we please may be made to appear for thus nature sometimes forms vapours so that two suns and two moons and even three at once appear in the air as pliny relates in the second book of his natural history for which reason many and an infinite number may appear in the air because after a thing has exceeded its unity no number is limited for it as aristotle argues in the chapter de vaco and thus in every city and on the other hand in every army there can be terrors infinite so that either through the multiplication of stellar apparitions or of men collected against them they may almost despair especially if the following instances should be taken with the first for glasses can be so constructed that things placed very far off may appear very near and vice versa so that from an incredible distance we may read the minutest letters and number things however little and make the stars appear where we will and thus it is believed that julius caesar on the shore of the sea in gaul discovered through huge glasses the disposition and sites of the castles and towns of great britain bodies may also be so constructed that the greatest may appear the least and vice versa the high may appear low and lowest and vice versa the hidden things may appear in sight for thus socrates discovered that the dragon poisoning the city and district with his pestilential breath lived in coverts among the mountains thus also on the other hand everything in cities or armies could be discovered by their enemies bodies could also be so constructed that poisonous beings and influences and infections could be let off whenever men wished for thus it is said that aristotle taught alexander in which instance the poison of a basilisk erected on the wall of a city against his army was turned against the city itself glasses could also be so constructed that every man could see gold and silver and whatever a man wished and whoever should hasten to the place of the vision should find nothing it behooves us therefore not to use magic illusions when the power of philosophy teaches us to perform quite enough but there is a sublimer power of construction by which the rays may be drawn and collected through various shapes and reflections to any distance we wish so far that any object may be burned for burning glasses acting forward and backward attest this as certain authors teach in their books and the greatest of all constructions and of things constructed is that the skies may be depicted according to their longitudes and latitudes in corporeal figure as they are moved in their daily motion and these things are worth a kingdom to the wise man these then suffice for examples of constructions however infinite a number of others may be put forward meantime of concealing the secrets of nature and art having enumerated certain examples concerning the power of nature and art that from a few things we may comprehend many from its parts the whole and from particulars universals so far that we may see it is not necessary for us to aspire after magic when art and nature suffice i wish now to follow items through their class and their causes and to give their method in particular but i judge that the secrets of nature are not transmitted through the skins of goats and sheep that they may be understood by any one who chooses just as socrates and aristotle wish and aristotle himself says in his book of secrets that he should be the breaker of the heaven seals if he communicated the secrets of nature and art adding how many evils follow him who reveals secrets further on in his point a gellius says in the book of the attic nights on the feast of the wise that it is foolish to offer lettuces to an ass when a thistle is enough for him 
and in the book of stones it is written that he lessens the majesty of things who divulges mystic ones nor do secrets remain of which the crowd is partaker by a commendable division the populace may be divided in opposition to the wise for what is seen by all is true and likewise what is seen by the wise and most of all by the noted therefore what is seen by the many that is the populace as far as of this sort ought to be held false i speak of the populace which is distinguished as against the wise in this commendable division for in the common conceptions of the mind it agrees with the wise but in the special principles and conclusions of the arts and sciences it disagrees with the wise laboring about appearances in sophisms and worthless matters which the wise do not care for in special and secret things therefore the populace errs and thus it is divided against the wise but in the common conceptions of the mind it is restrained under universal law and agrees with the wise but the cause of this secrecy toward the populace on the part of the wise was because the populace derides the wise and pays no heed to the secrets of wisdom and does not know enough to use the worthiest things and if by chance anything grand falls under its notice it destroys it and abuses it to the multiplex harm of persons and the community and so it is insane that anything secret should be written down unless it be concealed from the populace and with difficulty understood by the most studious and the wise so has run all the multitude of the wise from the beginning and it has hidden in many ways the secrets of wisdom from the populace for some have hidden many things by characters and charms others by enigmatic and figurative words as aristotle in the book of secrets saying to alexander o oh, alexander i wish to show you the greatest secret of secrets and the divine power shall aid you to conceal the mystery and to execute the design take therefore the stone which is not a stone and it is in what man you will and what place you will and what time you will and it is called the philosopher's egg and the terminus of the egg and thus innumerable things are found in many books and various sciences obscured by such speeches so that they cannot in any way be understood without a teacher how to make the philosopher's egg or stone and gunpowder six hundred and thirty years of the arabs being finished namely eleven fifty two a d i respond to your petition in this manner let there be taken of the bones of ada and of lime the same weight and let there be six at the stone of tagus and five at the stone of union and let them be rubbed up at the same time with water of life whose property it is to dissolve all other things so that they may be dissolved in it and cooked together and let this rubbing and cooking be repeated until they are incerated that is that the parts may be united as in wax and the sign of inceration is that the medicine liquefies over intensely glowing iron then let it be placed in the same water in a hot and damp place or suspended in the stream of very hot water then let them be dissolved and hardened in the sun then you are to take saltpetre and pour quicksilver upon lead and again wash and cleanse the lead with it so that it may be very near to silver and then operate as before also let the whole weight be thirty but yet of salt peter luro vopovir con utriet of sulphur and thus you may make thunder and lightning if you know the method of construction you can see nevertheless whether i speak enigmatically or truthfully and some may have judged otherwise for it has been said to me that you ought to resolve everything into a primal material on which you have two deliverances from aristotle in his popularized and famous book 
on account of which i am silent and when you have possessed yourself of that then you will have pure elements simple and equal and you may do this by contrary means and various operations which i have before called the keys of art and aristotle says that equality of powers excludes action and passion and corruption and Averroes says this in reprobation of galen and that is rated simpler in medicine and pure which can be procured and this is worth more than fevers and affections of the mind and body farewell and whoever shall have opened these things will have the key which opens them and no one may shut it and when he shall have shut it no one may open it end of the non-existence of magic by roger bacon twelve hundred and fourteen to twelve hundred and ninety four on lying awake at night by stuart edward white this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org on lying awake at night this is from the forest one of stuart edward white's many delightful volumes a very large public has enjoyed mr white's writings many of his readers perhaps without accurately realizing how extraordinarily good they are mr white was born in grand rapids michigan eighteen seventy three studied at the university of michigan has hunted big game in africa served as major of field artillery nineteen seventeen to nineteen eighteen and is a fellow of the royal geographical society his first book the westerners was published in nineteen o one since when they have followed regularly who hath lain alone to hear the wild goose cry about once and so often you are due to lie awake at night why this is so i have never been able to discover it apparently comes from no predisposing uneasiness of indigestion no rashness in the matter of too much tea or tobacco no excitation of unusual incident or stimulating conversation in fact you turn in with the expectation of rather a good night's rest almost at once the little noises of the forest grow larger blend in the hollow bigness of the first rouse your thoughts drift idly back and forth between reality and dream when snap you are broad awake perhaps the reservoir of your vital forces is full to the overflow of a little waste or perhaps more subtly the great mother insists thus that you enter the temple of her larger mysteries for unlike mere insomnia lying awake at night in the woods is pleasant the eager nervous straining for sleep gives way to a delicious indifference you do not care your mind is cradled in an exquisite poppy suspension of judgment and of thought impressions slip vaguely into your consciousness and is vaguely out again sometimes they stand stark and naked for your inspection sometimes they lose themselves in the mist of half sleep always they lay soft velvet fingers on the drowsy imagination so that in their caressing you fill the vaster spaces from which they have come peaceful brooding your faculties receive hearing sight smell all are preternaturally keen to whatever of sound and sight and woods perfume is abroad through the night and yet at the same time active appreciation dozes so these things lie on its sweet and cloying like fallen rose leaves in such circumstances you will hear what the voyagers call the voices of the rapids many people never hear them at all they speak very soft and low and distinct beneath the steady roar and dashing beneath even the lesser tinklings and gurglings whose quality superimposes them over the louder sounds they are like the tear forms swimming across a field of vision which disappear so quickly when you concentrate your sight to look at them and which reappear so magically when again your gaze turns vacant in the stillness of your hazy half-consciousness they speak when you bend your attention to listen they are gone and only the tumults and the tinklings remain but in the moments of their audibility they are very distinct just as often an odor will wake all a vanished memory so these voices by the force of a large impressionism suggest whole scenes far off are the cling clang cling of chimes and the swell and fall murmur 
of a multitude on fete, so that suddenly you fill the gray old town with its walls, the crowded marketplace, the decent peasant crowd, the booths, the mellow church building with its bells, the warm dust moted sun, or in the pauses between the swish dash dashings of the waters sound faint and clear voices singing intermittently, calls, distant notes of laughter, as though many canoes were working against the current. Only the flotilla never gets any nearer, nor the voices louder. The voyagers call these mist people the huntsmen, and look frightened. To each is his vision, according to his experience. The nations of the earth whisper to their exiled sons through the voices of the rapids. Curiously enough, by all reports, they suggest always peaceful scenes. A harvest field, a street fair, a Sunday morning in a cathedral town, careless travelers, never the turmoils and struggles. Perhaps this is the great mother's compensation in a harsh mode of life. Nothing is more fantastically unreal to tell about, nothing more concretely real to experience, than this undernote of the quick water, and when you do lie awake at night, it is always making its unobtrusive appeal. Gradually its hypnotic spell works. The distant chimes ring louder and nearer as you cross the borderland of sleep, and then outside the tent some little woods noise snaps the thread. An owl hoots, a whippoorwill cries. A twig cracks beneath the cautious prowl of some night creature. At once the yellow sunlit French meadows puff away. You are staring at the blurred image of the moon spraying through the texture of your tent. The voices of the rapids have dropped into the background, as have the dashing noises of the stream. Through the forest is a great silence, but no stillness at all. The whippoorwill swings down and up the short curve of his regular song. Over and over, an owl says his rapid whoo, whoo, whoo. These, with the ceaseless dash of the rapids, are the web on which the night traces her more delicate embroideries of the unexpected. Distant crashes, single and impressive. Stealthy footsteps near at hand. The subdued scratching of claws, a faint sniff, sniff, sniff of inquiry. The sun and clear tin horn, co, 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 oh, of the little owl the mournful, long-drawn-out cry of the loon, instinct with the spirit of loneliness, the ethereal call-note of the birds of passage high in the air, a patter-patter-patter among the dead leaves, immediately stilled, and then at the last, from the thicket close at hand, the beautiful silver purity of the white-throated sparrow, the nightingale of the north, trembling with ecstasy of beauty, as though a shimmering moonbeam has turned to sound and all the while the blurred figure of the moon mounting to the ridge line of your tent these things combine subtly until at last the great silence of which they are a part overarches the night and draws you forth to contemplation no beverage is more grateful than the cup of spring water you drink at such a time no moment more refreshing than that in which you look about you at the darkened forest you have cast from you with the warm blanket the drowsiness of dreams a coolness physical and spiritual bathes you from head to foot. All your senses are keyed to the last vibrations. You hear the littler night prowlers. You glimpse the greater. A faint, searching woods perfume of dampness greets your nostrils. And somehow, mysteriously, in a manner not to be understood, the forces of the world seem in suspense, as though a touch might crystallize infinite possibilities into infinite power and motion. But the touch lacks. The forces hover on the edge of action unheeding the little noises in all humbleness and awe you are a dweller of the silent places at such a time you will meet with adventures one night we put fourteen inquisitive porcupines out of camp near mcgregor's bay i discovered in the large grass park of my campsite nine deer cropping the herbage like so many beautiful ghosts a friend tells me of a fawn that every night used to sleep outside his tent and within a foot of his head probably by way of protection against wolves its mother had in all likelihood been killed. The instant my friend moved toward the tent opening, the little creature would disappear, and it was always gone by earliest daylight. Nocturnal bears in search of pork are not uncommon, but even though your interests meet nothing but the bats and the wood shadows and the stars, that few moments of the sleeping world forces in a physical experience to be gained in no other way. You cannot know the night by sitting up. She will sit up with you. Only by coming into her presence from the borders of sleep can you meet her face to face in her intimate mood. The night wind from the river or from the open spaces of the wilds chills you after a time. 
you begin to think of your blankets in a few moments you roll yourself in their soft wool instantly it is morning and strange to say you have not to pay by going through the day unrefreshed you may feel like turning in at eight instead of nine and you may fall asleep with unusual promptitude but your journey will begin clear-headedly proceed springily and end with much in reserve no languor no dull headache no exhaustion follows your experience for this once your two hours of sleep have been as effective as nine end of on lying awake by stuart edward whites read by april six zero nine zero california united states of america a short chapter on bustles by anonymous from the irish penny journal of eighteen forty this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A short chapter on bustles. Bustles. What are bustles? I, reader, fair reader, you may well ask that question. But some of your sex at least know the meaning of the word and the use of the article it designates sufficiently well, though thank heaven there are many thousands of my countrywomen who are as yet ignorant of both and indeed to whom such knowledge would be quite useless would that i were an equally innocent ignorance not reader that i am of the feminine gender and use the article in question but my knowledge of its mysterious uses and the various materials of which it is composed has been the ruin of me i will have inscribed on my tomb here lies a man who was killed by a bustle but before i detail the circumstances of my unhappy fate it will perhaps be proper to give a description of the article itself which has been the cause of my undoing well then a bustle is but the editor will perhaps object to this description as being too distinct and graphic if so then here goes for another less labored and more characteristically mysterious a bustle is an article used by ladies to take from their form the character of the venus of the greeks and imparts to it that of the Venus of the Hottentots. That ladies should have a taste so singular may appear incredible, but there is no accounting for tastes, and I know to my cost that the fact is indisputable. I made the discovery a few years since, and up to that time I had always borne the character of a sage, sedate, and promising young man, one likely to get on in the world by my exertions, and therefore sure to be helped by my friends. I was even, I flatter myself, a favorite with the fair sex, too, and justly so, for I was their most ardent admirer, and there was one most lovely creature among them whom I had fondly hoped to have made my own, but alas, how vain and visionary are our hopes of human happiness. Such hopes with me have fled forever. As I said before, I am a ruined man, and all in consequence of ladies' bustles. In an unlucky hour I was in a ballroom seated at a little distance from my fair one my eyes watching her every air and look my ears catching every sound of her sweet voice when i heard her complain to a female friend in tones of the softest whispering music that she was oppressed with the heat of the place my dear her friend replied it must be the effect of your bustle what do you stuff it with hair horse hair was the reply hair mercy on us says her friend it is no wonder you are oppressed. That is a hot and hot material, truly. Why, you should do as I do. You do not see me fainting, and the reason is that I stuff my bustle with hay, new hay. I heard no more, for the ladies, supposing from my eyes that I was a listener, changed the topic of conversation, though indeed it was not necessary, for at the time I had not the slightest notion of what they meant. Time, however, passed on most favorably to my wishes another month and i should have called my catherine my own she was on a visit to my sister and i had every opportunity to make myself agreeable we sang together we talked together and we danced together all this would have been very well but unfortunately we also walked together it was on the last time we ever did so that the circumstance occurred which i have now to relate and which gave the first death blow to my hopes of happiness we were crossing Carlisle Bridge, her dear arm linked in mine, when we chanced to meet a female friend, and wishing to have a little chat with her without incommoding the passengers, we got to the edge of the flagway, near which at the time there was standing an old white horse, totally blind. 
He was a quiet-looking animal, and none of us could have supposed from his physiognomy that he had any savage propensity in his nature. But imagine my astonishment and horror when I suddenly heard my charmer give a scream that pierced me to the very heart, and when I perceived that the atrocious old blind brute, having slowly and slyly swayed his head around, caught the, how shall I describe it, caught my Catherine, really I can't say how, but he caught her, and before I could extricate her from his jaws, he made a reef in her garments such as a lady never suffered. Silk gown, petticoat, bustle, everything, in fact, gave way, and left an opening, a chasm, an exposure that may perhaps be imagined but cannot be described. As rapidly as I could, of course, I got my fair one into a jarvey and hurried home, the truth gradually opening in my mind as to the cause of the disaster. It was that the blind horse, hungry brute, had been attracted by the smell of my Catherine's bustle, made of hay, new hay. Catherine was never the same to me afterwards. She took the most invincible dislike to walk with me, or rather perhaps to be seen in the streets with me. But matters were not yet come to the worst, and I had indulged in hopes that she would yet be mine. I had taken, however, a deep aversion to bustles, and even determined to wage war upon them to the best of my ability. In this spirit, a few days after, I determined to wreak my vengeance on my sister's bustle, for I found by this time that she too was emulous of being a hot and top beauty. Accordingly, having to accompany her and my intended wife to a ball, I stole into my sister's room in the course of the evening before she went into it to dress, and pouncing upon her hated bustle, which lay on her toilet table, I inflicted a cut on it with my penknife and retired. But what a mistake did I make! Alas, it was not my sister's bustle, but my Catherine's. However, we went to the ball, and for a time all went smoothly on. I took my Catherine as a partner in the dance. But imagine my horror when I perceived her gradually becoming thinner and thinner, losing her in bon point as she danced, and worse than that, that every movement which she described in the figure, the lady's chain, the chasse, was accurately marked, recorded, on the chalked floor with bran. Oh dear, reader, pity me, was ever man so unfortunate? This sealed my doom. She would never speak to me or even look at me afterwards. But this was not all. My character with the sex, I with both sexes, was also destroyed. I who had been heretofore, as I said, considered as an example of prudence and discretion for a young man, was now set down as a thoughtless, devil-may-care wag, never to do well. The men treated me coldly, and the women turned their backs upon me. And so thus, in reality, they made me what they had supposed I was. It was indeed no wonder for I could never after see a lady with a bustle, but I felt an irresistible inclination to laughter, and this, too, even on occasions when I should have kept a grave countenance. If I met a couple of country or other friends in the street and inquired after their family, the cause, perhaps, of the mourning in which they were attired, while they were telling me of the death of some father, sister, or other relative, I, to their astonishment, would take to laughing, and if there was a horse near us, give the lady a drag away to another situation." And if then I were asked the meaning of this ill-timed mirth and this singular movement, what could I say? Why, sometimes I made the matter worse by replying, Dear madam, it is only to save your bustle from the horse. Stung at length by my misfortunes and the hopelessness of my situation, I became utterly reckless, and only thought of carrying out my revenge on the bustles in every way in my power. And this, I must say, with some pride I did for a while with good effect." I got a number of the hated articles manufactured for myself, but not, reader, to wear, as you shall hear. Oh, no, but whenever I received an invitation to a party, which indeed had latterly been seldom sent me, I took one of those articles in my pocket, and, watching a favorable opportunity when all were engaged in the mazy figure of the dance, let it secretly fall among them. The result may be imagined. I, reader, imagine it, for I cannot describe it with effect." First, the half-suppressed but simultaneous scream of all the ladies as it was held up for a claimant. Next, the equally simultaneous movement of the ladies' hands, all quickly disengaged from those of their partners, and not raised up in wonder, but carried down to their bustles. Never was movement in the dance executed with such precision, and I should be immortalized as the inventor of an attitude so expressive of sentiment and of feeling. Alas, this is the only consolation now afforded me in my afflictions. 
I invented a new attitude, a new movement in the quadrille. Let others see that it not be forgotten. I am now a banished man from all refined society. No lady will appear where that odious Mr. Bustle, as they call me, might possibly be, and so no one will admit me inside their doors. I have nothing left me, therefore, but to live out my solitary life and vent my execration of bustles in the only place now left me, the columns of the Irish Penny Journal. End of A Short Chapter on Bustles by Anonymous Read by Colleen McMahon The Short-Leaved Sundew in Virginia by Gerrit S. Miller, Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. During the second week of May, 1903, I found the short-leaved sundew common in a low, moist field near the shore of Hampton Roads, about three miles west of Hampton, Virginia. The situation was open, and rather less wet than those generally occupied by the more northern members of the genus, since the Drosera was closely associated with such plants as Pistonia carulia and Pontentilia canadensis, rather than with the characteristic bog species. During the early hours of the day, the plant was conspicuous on account of its large whitish flowers, exceeding in size those of either of its companions. But by noon the corollas closed, and the slender scapes and small rosettes of reddish leaves were not easily detected among the grass. This record extends the northward range of Drosaria brevifolia from southern North Carolina and adds another to the list of lower austral plants known to reach the region of the lower Chesapeake Bay. End of the Short-Leaved Sundew in Virginia by Gerrit S. Miller, Jr. Read for LibriVox.org by Melanie T. Sign Language Among Schoolchildren by Ernest Thompson Seton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Ferrard. Sign Language Among Schoolchildren by Ernest Thompson Seton. In taking observations among schoolboys and girls, I had this uniform experience, all denied any knowledge of the sign language, at first, but were themselves surprised on discovering how much of it they had in established use. One very shy little girl, so shy that she dared not speak, furnished a good illustration. Do you use the sign language in your school? I asked. She shook her head. Do you learn any language but English? She nodded. What is the use of learning any other than English? She raised her right shoulder in the faintest possible shrug and, at the same time, turned her right palm slightly up. Now, was my reply, don't you see you have answered all my three questions in signs which you said you did not use? Following the subject, I said, what does this mean? And I held up my right hand with the first and second fingers crossed. Pax, she whispered. And then, after further trials, I learned that at least thirty signs were in daily use in that local school. This was in England. In America, the sign Pax, or King's Cross, is called King's X. Fines, or fins, or fens bars up, or truce, meaning always, I claim immunity. This is a very ancient sign, and seems to refer to the right of sanctuary. The name King's Cross, used occasionally in England, means probably the sanctuary in the King's Palace. In general, I found about 150 gesture signals, 
in established use among american school children namely me tap one's own chest you pointing to you yes nod no shake head good nod and clap hands bad shake head and grimace go pushing flat hand forward palm forward come drawing in flat hand palm toward one hurry the same repeated vigorously several times come for a moment beckon with forefinger hand unmoved stop flat hand held up palm forward gently flat hand held low palm down gently waved good-bye flat hand held high palm down and forward fingers quickly waved up and down up point up high flat hand palm down held up at arm's length deep left flat hand palm down at level of mouth right palm up as low as possible heaven point up very high and look up down point down forward swing index forward and down in a curve backward jerk thumb over shoulder across hold hand out flat palm down run right index across it over or above hold out flat left palm down and above it hold ditto right under reverse of foregoing hush index finger on lips listen curved hand behind ear look flat hand over eyes look there point and look in same direction touch reach out and touch with index taste lay finger on tongue smell hold palm to nose friendship handshake warning index finger held up threatening fist held up weeping with index finger at each eye trace course of tears shame on you point one index at the person and draw the other along it several times in same direction you make me ashamed cover eyes and face with hands mockery stick tongue out at person disdain snap fingers toward person scorn throw an imaginary pinch of sand at person insolent defiance thumb to nose hand spread arrogant indicate swelled head pompous indicate big chest incredulity expose white of eye with finger as though proving no green there i am no fool tap one side of the nose joke rub side of nose with index connivance winking one eye puzzled scratch the head crazy tap forehead with index then describe a circle with it despair pulling the hair sleepy put a fist in each eye bellyache hands clasped across the belly sick a grimace and a limp dropping of the hands applause clap hands victory swing an imaginary flag overhead upon my honor draw a cross over heart or cross the hands over breast i am seeking looking about and pointing finger in same directions i am thinking lay index on brow lower head and look out under brows i have my doubts slowly swing head from side to side i will not listen hold flat hands on ears i will not look cover eyes with hands i forget slowly shake head and brush away something in air near the forehead i claim exemption or fins or bar up 
middle finger crossed on index i beg of you flat hand palm to palm pointing to the person i pray clasped hands held up i am afraid or surrender hold up both flat hands palm forward i wind him around my finger make the action with right thumb and index around left index i have him under my thumb press firmly down with top of right thumb you surprise me flat hand on open mouth i send you a kiss kiss the fingertips of right hand and throw it forward search me hold the coat flaps open one in each hand swim strike out with flat hands dive flat hands together moved in a curve forward and down will you come swimming two fingers in v shape held up level will you or is it so look nod and raise brows fool or ass a thumb in each ear flat hands up cut throat draw index across throat indifference a shoulder shrug ignorance a shrug and a head shake pay hold out closed hand palm up rubbing thumb and index tips together jew flat hands waved near shoulders palms up bribe hold hollow hand palm up behind one it is in my pocket slap pocket with flat hand give me my bill beckon then write on air match make the sign of striking a match on the thigh set it afire sign match and then thrust it forward pistol making barrel with left index stock and hammer with right hooked on snapping right index from thumb that tastes good smack the lips the food was good pat the stomach bad taste grimace and spitting out bad smell hold the nose bend with right hand bend left index break with fists touching make as though to bend a stick then swing the fists apart hot wet middle finger in mouth reach it forward and jerk it back cold fists near shoulder and shaken paint use flat right as a brush to paint flat left shave use finger or thumb on face as a razor wash revolve hands on each other as in washing knife with right fist as though holding knife whittle left index revolver hold out right fist with index extended and thumb up gun or shooting hold hands as in aiming a gun drive horses work the two fists side by side give me hold out flat hand palm up right make the action with index strike strike down with fist fighting make the fists menace each other drinking lift right hand to mouth as though it held a glass smoking make as though holding a pipe and drawing rub it out wet tips of right fingers and seem to rub thank you bow and at the same time swing flat right palm up a little way down and to one side church hands clasped fingers in but index fingers up and touching get up raise flat right palm up from low up high sit down drop flat right palm down from high down low here pointing down hand swung in small circle in all a hundred and ten besides the compass points the features of the face the parts of the body the numerals up to twenty or thirty and a great many half-established signs such as book telephone 
ring the bell etc which if allowed would bring the number up to nearly two hundred as another line of observation i have asked new york boys how many signs does the broadway policeman use in regulating the traffic any bright child remembers presently that the officer seldom speaks could scarcely be heard if he did indeed he relies chiefly on sign language and hourly uses the established signs for stop come on come here go right go left go back hurry up go easy i warn you i'll punish you pass keep behind me scorn and perhaps one or two others while not infrequently the small boy responds with the sign of insolent defiance that is used the world round and was probably invented by cain and abel similarly the car conductor uses the signs for do you want this car do you want transfer how many go on as well as most of the above evidently then the sign language is used of necessity in much of our life where speech is impossible end of sign language among school children by ernest thompson seaton some nonsense about a dog by harry estes downs this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org harry estes downs was born in syracuse in 1889 and graduated from hamilton college in 1910 his first job was a cub reporter on the journal that newspapermen affectionately called the old sun the adjective is pronounced as though it were in italics he was on the staff of the syracuse herald nineteen twelve to nineteen fourteen spent a year in new orleans writing short stories and returned in nineteen sixteen to the magazine staff of the sun he was editor of the sun's book review section nineteen nineteen to nineteen twenty in nineteen twenty he joined the staff of the new york evening post my hand will miss the insinuated nose sir william watson but the dog that was written of must have been a big dog nibby was just a comfortable lapful once he had duly turned around and curled up with his nose in his tail this is for people who know about dogs in particular little mongrels without pedigree or market value other people no doubt will find it disgustingly maudlin i would have found it so before nibby came the day he came was a beautiful bright cool one in august a touring car brought him they put him down on our corner meaning to lose him but he crawled under the car and they had to prod him out and throw stones before they could drive on so that when i came home i found with his mistress-elect a sort of pot-bellied bundle of terry oakum caked with mud panting convulsively still from fright and showing the whites of uncommonly liquid brown eyes and a pink tongue there was tennis that evening and he went along i carried him over the railroad tracks he gave us no trouble about the balls but lay huddled under the bench where she sat and shivered if a man came near him that night he got chopped bones and she got a sensible homily on the unwisdom of feeding strays and he was left outdoors he slept on the mat the second morning we thought he had gone the third he was back wagging approval of us and intent to stay which seemed to leave no choice but to take him in we had fun over names jelly waggles suggested from next door was undeniably descriptive rags fitted or toby or nig but they had a colored maid next door finally we called him nibs and soon his tail would answer to it cleaned up scrubbed the insoluble matted locks clipped from his coat his trampish collar replaced with a new one he was far from being unpresentable a vet once opined that for a mongrel he was a good dog that a black cocker mother had thrown her cap over scottish mills so to speak this analysis accounted for him perfectly always depending on the moment's mood he was either terrier or a spaniel the snap and scrap and perk of the one alternating with the gentle snuggling indolence of the other as terrier he would dig furiously up by the hour after a field mouse as spaniel he would read the breeze with the best nose among the dog folk of our neighborhood or follow a trail quite well i know there was retrieving blood a year ago may he caught and brought me not doing the least injury 
an oriole that probably had flown against a wire and was struggling disabled in the grass nimmy was shabby genteel black sunburnt as to the mustache grizzled as to the raggy fringe on his haunches he had a white stock and shirt frill and a white forepaw brown eyes full of heart were the best point his body coat was rough scottish worsted the little black pate was cotton soft like shoddy and the big black ears were genuine spaniel silk as a terrier he held them up smartly and carried a plumy fish hook of a tail as a spaniel the ears drooped and the tail swung meekly as if in apology for never having been clipped the other day when we had to say good-bye to him each of us cut one silky tuft from an ear very much as we had so often when he'd been among the burdocks in the field where the garden is burrs were by no means nibby's only failing in flea time it seemed hardly possible that a dog of his size could sustain his population we finally found a true fleabane but deserted one day he was populous again the next they don't relish every human me they did i used to storm at him for it and he used between spasms of scratching to listen admiringly so and wag we think he supposed his tormentors were winged insects for he sought refuge in dark clothes closets where a flying imp wouldn't logically come he was wilful insisted on landing in laps when their makers wanted to read he would make advances to visitors who were polite about him he would get up on the living-room table why and how heaven knows finding his opportunity when we were out of the house and taking care to be upstairs on a bed white grimable coverlets preferred by the time we had the front door open i used to slip up to the porch and catch through a window the diving flourish of his sinful tail one of his faults must have been a neurosis really he led a hard life before we took him in as witnessed the game hind leg that made him sit up side saddle fashion and two such scars on his back as boiling hot grease might have made and something especially cruel had been done to him when asleep for if you bent over him napping or in his bed he would half rouse and growl and sometimes snap blindly we dreaded exuberant visiting children two or three experiments i hate to remember now convinced me that it couldn't be whipped out of him and once wide awake he was sure to be perplexedly apologetic he was spoiled that was our doing we babied him abominably he was for two years the only subject we had for such malpractice he had more foolish names than wog the dog of mrs stevenson's and heard more little language than stella ever did reciprocating by kissing proffered ears in his doggy way once he had brightened up after his arrival he showed himself ready to take on l whenever we gave an inch and he was always taking them and never paying penalties he had conscience enough to be sly i remember the summer evening we stepped outside for just an instant and came back to find a curious groove across the butter on the dining table and an ever so innocent nibby in a chair in the next room while we were at the table he was generally around it bulldozing for tidbits i fear he had reason to know that this would work one fortnight when his missy was away he slept on his old man's bed we had dropped titles of dignity with him by then and he rang the welkin hourly answering faraway dog friends and occasionally came north to lollop my face with tender solicitude just like the fool nursery in the story waking the patient up to ask if he was sleeping well more recently when a beruffled basket was waiting he developed an alarming trick of stealing in there to try it so i fitted that door with a hook ensuring a crack impervious to dogs and the other night i had to take the hook now useless off we couldn't stand hearing it jingle he adopted the junior member on first sight and sniff of him by the way would look on beaming as proudly as if he'd hatched him the last of his iniquities arose from a valor that lacked its better part an absurd mixture of falstaff and bantam rooster at the critical point he'd back out of a fuss with a big dog of his own size but let a police dog in airedale a saint bernard or a big ugly cur appear and nibby was all around him blackguarding him unendurably it was lucky that the big dogs in our neighborhood were patient and he never would learn about automobiles usually tried to tackle them head on often stopped cars with merciful drivers when the car wouldn't stop luck would save him by a fraction of an inch i couldn't spank that out of him either we had really been expecting what finally happened for two years that's about all too much i'm afraid a decent fate made it quick the other night and clean and close at hand in fact on the same street corner where once a car had left the small scapegrace for us 
we will tell ourselves how glad we are it happened as it did instead of an agonal ending such as many of his people come to we tell ourselves we couldn't have had him forever in any event that some day for the junior members sake we shall get another dog we keep telling ourselves these things and talking with animation on other topics the muzzle the leash the drinking dish are hidden the last muddy paw track swept up the no smudge is washed off the favorite front window pane but the house is full of a little snoofing wagging loving ghost i know how the boy thoreau felt about a hereafter with dogs barred i want to think that somewhere some time i will be coming home again and when that front door opens nibby will be on hand to keep her welcome end of some nonsense about a dog read by april six zero nine zero california united states of america tadpoles from the handbook of frogs and toads of the united states and canada by anna allen wright and albert hazen wright this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. relatively the eggs of some of the smaller frogs like the robber frogs or little chorus frogs are largest while the bullfrog may have some of the smallest eggs the size of the adult then does not determine the size of the egg the ribbed toad and robber frogs have unpigmented eggs the latter go through their whole development in the egg which is laid on land all the rest of the frogs have pigmented eggs in the north the egg-laying season may be very short while in the south some species may breed almost any month of the year the number of eggs a female may have to lay varies from six in the robber frogs or one hundred in the little chorus frog to twenty thousand in the bullfrog some lay single eggs on the bottom of the pond or stream they may be attached to vegetation or free submerged in the water or floating many lay floating films most forms in northern countries lay submerged eggs some like toads have the eggs in strings or tubes of jelly though one toad has them in bars of four or five eggs and another lays single eggs others like spadefoots may have them in bands later cylinders or even have the eggs on stalks of jelly one the ribbed toad has the eggs in a rosary string some like wood frogs and meadow frogs have globular or plinth like masses the egg proper or yolk is called the vitellus which usually has a rather tight-fitting membrane called the vitaline membrane the vitellus usually has the upper half or animal pole pigmented black brown etc while the lower half or vegetable pole is unpigmented white cream or yellowish these pigmented eggs are normal to most frogs which lay their eggs in water exposed to the sunlight but a few frogs in the united states lay their eggs on land and away from the sunlight such are unpigmented about the egg there may be one or two or more jelly envelopes which become evident a few minutes after the egg is laid in some masses of eggs the outer envelope loses its distinctness sometimes the eggs are in tubes of jelly as in the toads some like peepers lay each single egg separately while others lay several single eggs at one time some surface films represent the moving about of the female like tree toad or others like the bullfrog mass mean the frog remained in one position toads crawl about and string the file along spadefoots lay a band from the base of a plant to its end and then go to another plant 
most species which lay submerged masses have the whole complement in one mass the males usually precede the females to the water and croak vigorously during breeding time the male with its four arms seizes the female in almost all frogs the eggs are fertilized just at or slightly after the extrusion of the eggs at first no envelopes about the eggs are apparent and the egg mass may feel soft and sticky after a few minutes this substance absorbs water and each egg is then revealed with its vitaline membrane and one or more jelly envelopes the eggs hatch in three to twenty five days depending on temperature and other conditions at hatching the larva has a distinct neck with a prominent head and body the tail is very small or absent on the ventral side of the head is an invagination or depression which is to be the mouth behind this comes the ventral adhesive disc or discs which help the little creature to attach itself to the egg mass or to hang itself upon some plant in front of the mouth are two deep dark pits which later become the nostrils on either side of the head appear swellings which become the external gills the eyes do not yet appear as development goes on the external gills appear as branched organs two or three on a side the eye shows as a ring beneath the skin and the tail grows and presents a middle muscular portion where the muscle segments clearly show this middle part supports a thin wafer-like tail fin the parts of which are called respectively the lower and upper crests the nasal pit shifts in position and becomes the nostril and the vent opens the mouth appears and dependence on the yolk of the belly ceases soon the external gills begin to disappear a lateral flap or fold of skin connects the head with the body and the neck region disappears beneath this fold internal gills develop usually on the left side but on the middle line in the belly in ribbed frogs and narrow-mouthed toads the flap does not close completely but leaves an opening the spiracle the water passes into the mouth over the internal gills and out of this hole on the mouth a membranous fringed lip with upper and lower portions labia comes into being at the portal are horny jaws or mandibles on the upper and lower portions are ridges of horny teeth the eyes are no longer covered pigmented rings but are now at the surface the intestine has become much elongated and coiled and in some can be seen through the skin the skin of the back and head comes to have a series of sense organs or lateral line dots the buds of the hind limbs begin to appear the forelimbs start to develop beneath the skin when the hind limbs have reached considerable size the left arm comes out through the spiracle or the skin breaks down and later the right arm breaks through the skin or the skin weakens for its egress normally it is held that the left arm comes out first often the right arm appears first the process of transformation is now on the tail crests decrease in size and the creature begins to live on its tail that is to absorb it the gills vanish and the lungs begin to serve as the sole respiratory organs if the skin be not considered the tadpole appears more and more at the surface or near the shore the eye assumes eyelids the tadpole mouth fringe with its horny jaws and horny teeth is discarded and a true frog mouth begins to appear the long intestine becomes wonderfully shortened for a carnivorous diet and the small frog with a vestige of a tail is ready to leave the water this process is termed transformation or 
metamorphosis. End of Tadpoles from the Handbook of Frogs and Toads of the United States and Canada by Anna Allen Wright and Albert Hazen Wright. Read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson. Trees at Leisure by Anna Botsford Comstock. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. If we could know the part that trees have played in the aesthetic education of man, mayhap we should find that they began this great and silent schooling when the savage, weary from his chase in the hot sun, sought refuge in their refreshing shade. While resting there, his eyes raised to the overhanging branches, there may well have come to him an uplift in the vague consciousness of a realm of beauty as far above his ken as the branches and shifting leaves were above the reach of his hand. Ages may have passed before man gained sufficient mental stature to pay admiring tribute to the tree standing in all the glory of its full leafage, shimmering in the sunlight, making its myriad boughs to the restless winds. But eons must have lapsed before the human eye grew keen enough and the human soul large enough to give sympathetic comprehension to the beauty of bare branches laced across changing skies, which is the tree lover's full heritage. The mortal who has never enjoyed a speaking acquaintance with some individual tree is to be pitied. For such an acquaintance, once established, naturally ripens into a friendliness that brings serene comfort to the human heart whatever the heart of the tree may or may not experience. To those who know them, the trees, like other friends, seem to have their periods of reaching out for sympathetic understanding. How often this outreaching is met with repulse will never be told, for tree friends never reproach us, but wait with calm patience for us to grow into comprehension. In winter, we are prone to regard our trees as cold, bare and dreary. We bid them wait until they are again clothed in verdure, before we may accord them comradeship. However, it is during this winter resting time that the tree stands revealed to the utmost, ready to give its most intimate confidences to those who love it. It is indeed a superficial acquaintance that depends upon the garb worn for half the year. And to those who know them, the trees display even more individuality in the winter than in the summer. The summer is the tree's period of reticence, when, behind its mysterious veil of green, it is so busy with its own life processes that it has no time for confidences and may only now and then fling us a friendly greeting. The recognition of trees in this season of winter is a matter of experience and may not be learned from a book. Often the differences that distinguish them are too subtle to be put into words. However, some species portray their individuality in such a graphic manner that a wayfarer, though a fool, need not err therein. Such is the elm that graces our meadows and fields, where it marks the sites of fences present and past. At no other time of the year is the American elm more beautiful than when it traces its flowing lines against snow and grey skies. Whether the tree be young, slender and svelte, or grown to full stature, whether it be vase or fountain-shaped, there is in its dark twig-fringed bowl a grace shown in upward expansion, which is continued in the uplift of spreading branches and finds perfect expression in the final twigs that droop, as if in loving memory of their summer burden of leaves, in token of which the oriole's nest is tenderly held in safe-keeping. 
In sharp contrast to the benignant and inviting curves of the elm is the self-centred outline of the isolated sugar maple. Even this tree is more graceful in winter than in summer. It displays its many straight branches, lifted skyward and ending in finely divided but well-ordered sprays, while earlier it was merely an elongated green period that served to punctuate the summer landscape. Widely different in habit is the great maple of the woodland, whose noble bowl rises, a living pillar, to the arches that uphold the forest canopy. We do not need to look up to its high branches to know it, for shining grey colour and a certain majesty of mien proclaim at once its identity and its place as a peer in the forest realm. Who would believe that a granite grey column could hold a store of sweetness, which a few weeks later we may have for the asking? The maple, more than other trees, seems to need to have its close-fisted bushiness pruned away by jealous neighbours to make it great and fine and generous. To those who think that in winter a maple is simply a maple, we should like to point out in contrast to the tree just mentioned, the graceful, smooth, grey-barked red maple, that true to its name keeps a bit of winter landscape warm with its glow. Each of its bud-laden twigs a ruddy dreamer of scarlet past and crimson future. But, to return to the field, there are other tree tenants of the safe fence corners that are worth knowing. The low, broad fawn apple, with its more or less horizontal branches dividing and subdividing into a frenzy of twiglets, shows a fitting framework for the great bridal bouquet which will cover it next June. The straight-limbed bird cherry with its shining bark, perhaps in ragged transverse rolls, and those shrub cousins of the trees, the sumacs, like bronze candelabra, holding their dark pinnacles aloft, black sockets whence once blazed crimson flame. Many of the trees planted by man for man's enjoyment give as good returns in winter as in summer. The honey locust, rearing its slender height protectingly above the homestead, or above the memory of one, its great twisted branches making picturesque any scene, however homely, its maze of twigs still holding its large, spirally rolled pods, which will in due time skate away over icy snowdrifts and plant their seeds far from the parent tree. The black locust, less picturesque, seemingly conscious of its nakedness, retaining a scanty garment of little rustling pods until spring shall again bring it to its exquisitely wrought leaf mantle. The horse chestnut, painting itself in broad style against the pearly sky, its sparse, bud-tipped, clumsy twigs appearing like nobbled antennae put forth to test the safety of the neighbourhood. The tall, straight, cut-leaved birch with its central column of white and white branches ascending stark and stiff and then suddenly breaking into dark fountains of deliquescence the Lombardy poplar, a spire of green against summer horizons, now a vague wraith through whose transparent form we can see the sky and landscape beyond, and, as picturesque as any, the old apple tree, its great angulary twisted branches bearing a forest of aspiring shoots. The stream borders give us trees of strong individuality, the willows, unwilling even in summer to be taken for other tree species, assert their peculiarities quite as vigorously in winter. The golden osier displays its magnificent trunk and giant limbs upholding a mass of terminal shoots that tinge with warm ochre the winter landscape. The black willow, having cast its sickle leaves to the autumn winds, lifts itself in twins or triplets or even larger families of sister trees, 
that stand in close confab on borders of murmuring streams while the little pussy willows gather in neighbourly groups close to living brooks where in summer they shade the darting minnows and in winter cuddle contentedly under their snow blanket and listen to the contented gurgling of the ice-bound waters the sycamore loses nothing of its effectiveness when it loses its foliage the dull yellow of the trunk and the pale grey of the great undulating serpent-like branches blotched with white show as distinctly against the snow as they did against the summer green the very smoothness of the few large limbs make us unprepared for the way they break up into madness of terminal branchlets to which still cling here and there a button ball not yet whipped of its fibrous string how different the young trees so slender and shapely and over fond of reflecting their graceful figures in the still pools of streams it might seem that the stream guards wear a uniform of khaki in evidence of which behold the slender bowl of the great toothed poplar and that of the quaking aspen which has shaken off its agitation with its leaves and meets the winter winds with serene courage and likewise clad is the cottonwood that guardian of western rivers on which though it be ragged and unkempt the traveller's eye lingers lovingly another water-loving tree which revels in swamps is the pepper ridge extravagant in horizontal branches and twigs when young it stands gaunt and bare when old its main trunk looking like a decrepit mast with a few dilapidated yarn arms hanging on to it the tamaracks are its neighbours in summer graceful lacy cones they now flaunt their scant jaundiced spires against the blue sky unconscious of the sad picture they make in their conifer rally unnatural nakedness in the forest depths in winter we trust more to the shape and colour of the bowl and to the texture of the bark than to the branches above for recognition of old acquaintances the beech wears the crest of its nobility woven into the hues of its firm smooth bark its lower branches retain all winter many of their leaves russet now and sere whispering lonesomely to the winds and with its leaves it retains its burrs empty now of nuts and hanging in constellations quenched and black against the blue of the zenith novices often confuse the trunk of the beech with that of the birch for the very inadequate reason that both may be transversely striped with white the beech's stripes are woven into the texture of the firm fine-grained bark and are as unlike those of the tatterdemalion birch as could well be imagined the white birch coquettes with us with her untidy silken ribbons from the forest depths in a manner which a self-respecting beech would scorn and she is not the only one of her kind that wears shining ribbons although we are less likely to notice the darker colours of the black and yellow birches in all the woodland there is no more beautiful bark to be found than that which pencils the trunk of the white ash in fine vertical lines and fades away into smoothness on the lower limbs the ash branchlets though of pleasing lines are few and coarse those of the white ash give the effect of being warped into terminal curves contrast the bark of the white ash with the rugged virile bark of the hemlock and then turn to the basswood straight bowl and note the fine elongated network which covers it and learn to greet each as a friend well known and well beloved the hornbeam or blue beech ever tries to tie into a knot its twisted slender branches often even the grain of the wood is hard twisted so that the close bark shows as a loose spiral one wonders if it is because of this vital writhing 
that the sap which slowly oozes from the tree in spring soon turns red as blood. Very different in appearance is her sister, the hop hornbeam, whose slender trunk is covered with narrow, flattened scales that flake off untidily. The oak cannot be spared from the winter landscape. It is only when the oak stands bared like a runner for a race that we realise wherein its supremacy lies. We have made it a synonym of staunchness and sturdiness, but not until we see naked the massive trunk and the strong limbs bent and gnarled for thrusting back the blasts can we understand why the oak is staunch. However, there are oaks and oaks and each one fights time and tempest in its own peculiar armour and in its own brave way. The red, the scarlet and the black oaks show a certain ruggedness as of knotted sinews in their bowls, and their dark grey bark, irregularly furrowed, changes into flat plains above and smooths out into a soft, dark grey covering on the vigorous though twisted upper branches. The bark of the white oak is pale grey, divided by shallow fissures into elongated scales, yet with all a dignified dress for a noble tree. To one who is fortunate enough to have a Quaker grandfather, the white oak will bring a vision of him arrayed in his first day garb. However, there are vast differences in the white oaks of America, as we keenly realise if we compare the conservative white oak of the East with its erratic, picturesque sister of the Pacific coast. Picturesqueness gone mad, as described by an artist trying to sketch it. The hickories resemble the oaks, except they are more refined and less virile. Their limbs are shorter and grace is gained as strength is lost. Each species asserts an unmistakable individuality. The shag bark vaunts the superfluity of its raiment. The pig nut lifts a narrow oblong head, its lower branches gnarled and drooping. Less drooping are the lower branches of the mocha nut, and much more rounded its outline, while the bitter nut bowl divides into several large branches that spread and form a broad head. Those cousins of the hickories, the black walnut and the butternut, attract our attention by their sparse, rather coarse, terminal twigs. The wide, flattened ridges of its deeply furrowed bark distinguish the butternut and often suggest the long, smooth slats that hold the chestnut bowl in tight embrace. No winter scene is perfect without the evergreens, although these, until dead, never display to our curious eyes the history of their struggles for life as written on their naked branches. Yet to them alone among trees has a voice been given. The poet has often been more sensitive listener than seer in the natural world, and from the earliest times he is re-sung his fellow man the mysterious song of the pine although our evergreens retain their working garb yet they are trees of fine leisure during the months of frost and ice and whether they lift their mighty heads singly above the forest level or group themselves in green black masses they make strong the composition of the winter picture Nothing brings out perspective of the snow-covered hills like a clump of great hemlocks in the foreground, and the tassels of the pine are never so beautiful as when tossed in defiance against the stormy winter sky. Brave tree folk are these conifers of ours, whether their span of life extends over three centuries like our pines, or twenty like the redwoods. They give us a wide sense of the earth as an abiding place. On some winter mornings, even the most careless of mortals must pay admiring tribute to the trees. For again are they clad, 
this time in a glittering raiment of soft snow. Such a day is the apotheosis of winter, and one must needs go into the still forest and worship. The stillness is commensurate with the whiteness. The trees themselves seem conscious of it, and rebuff the iconoclast breathe with their slowly and silently moving branches. How differently the same forest meets the wind a few days later when a storm is brewing. Then the stiff branches with their twig sprays tear the howling intruder into whistling shreds until there is an all-pervading roar that is unlike any other of nature's sounds. It might well be compared to the surf breaking on a rocky shore if it were not that it seems overwhelming instead of restless conquering instead of unceasing, sentient instead of unaware. February is of the winter months, the impressionist, the colorist. In December, the forest masses on the hills were brown or gray. Now they are painted in warm purple, and the same royal color is to be seen in the shadows of the snowy valleys through a veil of sapphire haze that brings sky and forest and white hills into restful unity. This slowly increasing richness of colour of the late winter in our northern landscapes is not often appreciated. Long before the frost leaves the ground and the snow slinks away from the hillsides, the impulse of the warming sun is caught in the bark and buds. It is this warm tint of the forest in February that brings to the heart the first subtle prescience of spring, even before the chickadee fills it and makes the still woods echo with his sweet, prophesying Phoebe song. Happy is he who keeps his picture gallery always with him. His life is full of joy. To each of us is given a sky which many times a day is painted anew for our delectation, and it is never more perfect than when in winter it is a background against which the trees are etched. Whether the horizon be crimson with the sunrise or gold with the sunset, whether it displays the blue of the turquoise uplifted into the colour of the rose on snowy mornings, or glows with the amistine splendour of afternoons or the beryl tints of evening, the bare branches strongly outlined against it in harmonious contrast complete the colour chord. With infinitely varying hues, the trees there illuminate, and with exquisite and intricate writing, the trees there sign the diplomas of those whom they have educated. End of Trees at Leisure by Anna Botsford Comstock Read for LibriVox.org by Melanie T. Why Not the Stoopies by Harcourt Farmer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Reading by Matt Berard why not the stoopies by harcourt farmer from the theatre magazine 1919 poor productions unintelligent stage direction stereotyped plots maudlin sentiment gross vulgarity and dangerous viciousness rapidly losing for the picture house its former great popularity shall we call them stoopies it's just as short and expressive a word as movies, and it's a little more accurate. For the stuff that we are being deluged with today, in the name of the moving picture, has about reached the limit of crass stupidity. Time was, remotely ago, when the film gave a certain promise. There were a few big pictures with corking ideas behind them and those of us who were in the habit of dropping into a picture house for purposes of plain amusement hoped for better things but the one or two well we'll say three brainy directors have become so enthusiastic about the improvement of the movie that in their busy enthusiasm 
they've apparently forgotten how to improve it there's the pathetic example of one of our most prominent producers a man whose earlier pictures reached a very high level indeed but whose last three releases have been unintelligent compounds of sentimentality and incredible nonsense here is a man who could have done much but he's gone under the heavy seas of sugary stupidity have done for him recently we have been shown the isle of conquest norma talmage's latest release great expectations had been formed from the preliminary announcements of this picture the novel from which it was taken ranked among the best sellers yet its film production proved a rank disappointment the subtle wooing on the desert island the masterful man's gradual moral and physical victory over the delicately reared woman all that so potent on the printed page went for naught on the screen again the cinema had failed and so it goes a canvas of the last fifty important releases in the last six months fails to show one intelligent picture instead of a steady development in the writing of scenarios we've got a market decline there are pictures being shown all over the united states today that simply cannot be looked at not because they're immoral they not clever enough for that but because they are so amazingly cheap and tawdry day after day night after night the grossest of sentimentality and the most vicious kind of silliness are being unreal obviousness and crudity and vulgarity are being exploited by the commercially astute to such an extent that thinking people have become mentally paralyzed by the sickly stream of slush naturally this sort of thing is going to work both ways for in a very little while unless the manufacturers improve their wares thinking people won't go to the movies any more they'll be ashamed to be seen there the only kind of audience left will be those who have so lost the faculty of comprehension that they will sit watching the screen with the vacant stare of the idiotic the maudlin picture possesses a dangerous influence you can't see stupid stuff day in and day out without being affected by it people are rather particular about what their children read yet have no hesitation in letting them go to the movies worse they encourage them to go still worse they go with them and what do they benefit by it the doubtful ethics conveyed by the movie the offensive and insulting obviousness the deplorable unseriousness how can these things be of value to any of us it wouldn't be putting it too strongly to say that the movie has passed being just a nuisance it has become a menace the national backbone is unstiffened as each silly picture is shown there have been a thousand opportunities within the past five years to write and produce really sterling interesting inspiring material but no one has done it instead the public has been surfeited with the same old stories the same old chocolated situations the same old tedious ideas there has been a casual deviation now and then when some producer carefully underestimating our imbecility has made his picture a little more tedious than is the custom but this one puts down to zeal it's no good blaming the gentlemen who construct the scenarios they must live and it's rather futile to criticize too closely the individual producers they too like butter occasionally so is it a waste of valuable energy to attack the film editors they have their instructions these fellows are but wheels in the great industry they are simply paid workers but the men behind the big-picture combines the men who have the say as to what shall be pushed on the public and what shall not these are the men who are making fat fortunes out of the movie menace the movie has brought about a curious condition of things men who were formerly stage managers in obscure stock companies blossom out as great directors the ideas of some of them about stage direction would make a real stage director howl third-rate actors and actresses formerly confined to the hinterland by reason of their incompetency are now national stars in receipt of undeserved salaries 
the size of which would make a bank president gasp and writers who were wont to tickle the magazines with sporadic masterpieces now command stacks of dollars as scenario experts it's a joke there are many talented earnest men and women engaged in the film business but you'll find in the majority of cases that it is mediocrity who is invariably pushed to the front starred boomed puffed still more important a consideration is this that the movie has brought into being a special kind of audience that this audience is largely composed of the illiterate and the unmental speaks volumes for the improvement of the movie they have learned by the studied administration of the movie magnets not to expect the best but to accustom themselves to the worst they have become inured to being fed on slush they have been trained to pay liberally for great chunks of sob stuff and drivel they are strenuously induced to believe that it is the public demand for pish-posh that brings stupid pictures into being and of course this state of intellectual coma is commercially encouraged we are told that there is a national demand for screened sentimentality obviously there is but is any person with common sense going to believe that the demand isn't skillfully engineered just as long as people continue to take whatever the movie people give them so much longer will be the reign of the silly stuff do you mean to tell me that the kind of mush that is served just now in our movie theatres is the best the film people can produce god has given them brains is this all they can do the moving picture has taken a definite and permanent place in our life in the right hands it can be a most potent and powerful instrument of amusement in the wrong hands it resolves itself into a sword in baby hands you can't tell what harm it's going to do it is not too exacting a demand to make of the picture people that they give the public the very best possible value for its money if the thinking section of the public doesn't get the right sort of picture very soon it will take the line of least resistance it seems to me that the picture people have a very big opportunity right now to produce the best that is in them if they don't they will be the losers in the long run end of why not the stoopies by harcourt farmer <laughs>